Previously, we talked about the Schrodinger equation solutions for the hydrogen atom, and we looked at the wave functions and the energy eigenvalues, and it was clear the energy eigenvalues were the same energies that the Bohr model produces. In this video, we're going to talk about corrections to that because in reality, the energies are different for different angular momentum levels within a shell. So each subshell can have a different energy level. And we already talked about one of those splittings last time with the relativistic correction, which gave us a splitting based on orbital angular momentum. In this video, we're going to talk about another correction called the spin orbit coupling which gives you a splitting as a result of the total angular momentum j. Remember, j is L plus s. It's called spin-orbit coupling because of the coupling between L and s. The key term in this treatment is going to be the cross term when we look at j squared. You square a vector, that's the same thing as the dot product of that vector. And, of course, that gives you L squared plus s squared plus 2L dot S, and that cross term is going to be the key feature where we will talk about today. That's why it's called spin-orbit coupling. This is the key outcome of what's called the Russell-Saunders scheme, which is the coupling scheme by which eigenstates are constructed for the good eigenvalues J, M sub J, L, and S which I described in the good quantum numbers lecture. What's going on inside of an atom is besides the electron orbiting, and we talked last time about how it orbits and at almost relativistic speed, the electron is also moving in that electric field that the nucleus generates. The nucleus being positively charged makes a lot of electric field, and you're dragging this magnetic dipole moment of the electron through that field, Remember, the magnetic dipole moment is the gyromagnetic ratio times the spin angular momentum. There's a magnetic field present because the electron is moving through an electric field. From special relativity, we see the coupling between the B field and the E field. If you move through an electric field E vector with a velocity V vector, the magnetic field that you sense is given by the cross product of that velocity and the electric field divided by C squared. And so that electron has a magnetic dipole moment, and it's moving through a magnetic field. There's a potential energy that you can write because you have this magnetic dipole moment of the electron, gamma times s, in a magnetic field. And when a dipole moment is in a magnetic field, there's a potential energy, just minus mu dot b. In this uh, context, it's referred to as a Larmor interaction Hamiltonian. So you have the electron's dipole moment dotted with the magnetic field that results from the electron's motion through the electric field of the nucleus. We often explain this in general physics as the electron is seeing the nucleus orbit around it, making a magnetic field, but th this is the more appropriate way of explaining the presence of a magnetic field. There's an important vector in this orbit system, and that's the angular momentum vector, which is perpendicular to the orbit therefore perpendicular to the velocity of the electron. And the angular momentum vector of the orbiting electron is in the same direction as V cross E, on account of the fact that a cross product between the electric field, which is radial, and the velocity is going to give you a vector in that same direction. So we have to understand this cross product between the electric field and the velocity of the electron. The electron has a certain angular momentum, L. You know, L is mr cross v, but it's going in a circle. The radius of rotation and the velocity are perpendicular, so the angular momentum is mr v, or rather that velocity is angular momentum over mr. And so let's use L over mr for velocity. The direction of v cross e is this perpendicular direction. One way to write a unit vector is to take the ratio of the angular momentum vector to the angular momentum magnitude. And that's the unit vector that describes the direction of V cross E. Just looking at the cross product V cross E, the velocity can be L over MR. E is the Coulombic type electric field, so 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught charge over R squared. And the direction of that cross product is, as I just argued, the angular momentum over L. So we can cancel a power of angular momentum 
and v cross e has angular momentum in it. Insert this expression for v cross e into the Larmor interaction Hamiltonian, and we have a final expression for that Larmor interaction Hamiltonian, which is not the full story, but it's very, very close to it. This is the perturbation of the Hamiltonian due to coupling between spin angular momentum and orbital angular momentum, except for one more consideration, which is outside of our scope, and that's an additional relativistic correction called Thomas precession. I'll give you a, a conceptual overview of what that might be. If you have this electron orbiting around a nucleus, so the big green ball is the electron, it has a spin angular momentum vector. As it proceeds around the orbit, the spin angular momentum vector is going to trace out its own pattern as it proceeds. And when the electron comes all the way back to the same place where it was one orbit ago, the spin angular momentum is more likely than not going to be pointing in a different direction. And that needs to be accounted for. If you just look at the electron at one place every time it comes around, you'll see that the spin keeps moving. And so there is a precession of the spin relative to the ecliptic axis. And what's outside of our scope is determining the perturbation Hamiltonian from that effect, the Thomas precession Hamiltonian. I have it written down here, and you'll notice it looks just like the spin orbit Hamiltonian we just wrote, except for an 8 in the denominator, whereas the Larmor precession Hamiltonian had a 4 in the denominator and a different sign. But if you add them together, you have the total spin orbit Hamiltonian. This simply accounts for the fact that uh, the actual spin orbit Hamiltonian is half the Larmor precession Hamiltonian when you account for Thomas precession as well. That is the perturbation Hamiltonian we will work with. I have sort of ghosted out here this equals B S dot L. So everything between these parentheses was referred to as B in our previous video on good quantum numbers. But we're going to keep what's in between these parentheses and work with them and rearrange them. The total complete Hamiltonian then is the unperturbed hydrogen atom Hamiltonian plus the spin orbit Hamiltonian. But there are other effects. Remember last time we did a relativistic correction and you can go back and look at what I was referring to before is H sub REL which is a perturbation Hamiltonian that accounts for the fact that the electron's velocity going around the orbit is slightly relativistic and that causes some splitting between p subshells and s subshells the spin orbit hamiltonian we will deal with today causes additional splittings within subshells in order to find the first order correction to the energy we need to get the expectation value of the spin orbit hamiltonian but we can only do that if we have good eigenstates to work with otherwise we're saddled with finding the entire W matrix and solving the eigenvalue problem from that. But we've already established that S dot L has the same quantum numbers as the unperturbed Hamiltonian as long as you limit yourself to J, M sub J, L and S. We'll have to find the expectation value of two things, not the constants in front, but the expectation value of s dot l and the expectation value of 1 over r cubed. Let's start with that. We're going to use Kramer's relation to find the expectation value of 1 over r cubed. This particular relation was derived specifically for the hydrogen atom. So these expectation value symbols mean the expectation value of whatever I write inside there using the hydrogen atom wave functions. And what Kramer's relation does is it helps you find expectation value specifically of powers of r as long as you know the expectation value of other powers of r which happen to be adjacent powers i'll show you here's a relation right here it relates the expectation value of r to the q to expectation value of r to the q minus one to the expectation value of r to the q minus two or q is any integer and for our specific problem we want to find the expectation value of r to the minus 3, so if you allow q to equal minus 1, we can find it because we've already worked out the expectation value of r to the minus 2 and r to the minus 1 in a previous lecture in class that came from the Hellman Feynman theorem. So put in q equals minus 1. You see the first term goes away. So what we end up with is something that relates r to the minus 3 to r to the minus 2, and we Fortunately, I already know r to the minus 2, 
And so we're going to use that. It came from the Hellman-Feynman theorem. It worked out in class the other day. And the expectation value of 1 over r squared for any uh, hydrogen atom state is 1 over that. L plus a half n cubed a squared. A is the Bohr radius. So now a little bit of algebra. Get r to the minus 3 on one side and everything else on the other side. Replace the expectation value of r to the minus 2 with this expression. And the expectation value of r to the minus 3 is this. You can follow through the algebra. It's all in front of you if you wish to. L is the, the angular momentum quantum number. N is the principal quantum number, and A is the Bohr radius, half an angstrom or so. I'm going to manipulate this a little bit by multiplying it by 1, and today my choice of 1 is 1 fourth divided by 1 fourth. Gets the 1 fourth out of the numerator, and we bring this 1 fourth in the denominator inside the big parentheses here and simplify a little bit, and I'll let you try the algebra there. It's not too messy, and you have this expression which you find published in books and you notice i did not factor out this l perhaps i could have but i didn't putting this expectation value of one over r cubed into the spin orbit hamiltonian whose expectation value is all this stuff we have an expression now for the expectation value of the spin orbit hamiltonian but we still don't know one thing and that is what is the expectation value of s dot l and for that we'll rely on our earlier lecture on good quantum numbers where we concluded that eigenstates of the hydrogen atom will serve as eigenstates for s dot l provided we don't include m sub l and m sub s and you might say well how do you do that and I would say you don't need to know how you do that. I'm not going to write out the eigenfunctions of the hydrogen atom. I'm not going to think about what they look like if you aren't considering the Z components. I'm just going to use the fact that S dot L's quantum numbers are acceptable. And I just need to figure out how I will get those quantum numbers. Well, S dot L is a dot product, but it's the result of taking the total angular momentum vector and squaring it with itself. In case you had previously missed it, j dot j, or rather j squared, is l plus s vectors dot l plus s. And so you have l squared plus s squared plus 2l dot s. That's j squared. So you can relate l dot s to j squared, l squared, and s squared, we absolutely know their eigenvalues. The eigenvalue of j squared is j times j plus 1 times h bar squared, and l squared is l times l plus 1 times h bar squared, and so forth. And so now we know the expectation value of s dot l. A little simplification comes from the fact that s is 1 half, so that we can just write 3 fourths instead of dragging s times s plus 1 around with us. Plug this back into our expression for the expectation value of the spin orbit perturbation Hamiltonian, and we ha finally have the energies of spin orbit coupling. These are the shifts that have to occur for every level in a hydrogen atom due to spin orbit coupling, which is a combination of Larmor precession and Thomas precession. That's the first order correction to the energy, so in our textbook's notation, you might write it as E1. The constants in front can be simplified down to something much nicer because embedded in all these constants is actually E sub n, the energy eigenvalues for the unperturbed hydrogen atom. So let's take a look at that. This is all the stuff that was just circled in blue. And a little rearrangement. Let's put mc squared by itself over here. We'll keep that in the end. And let's put n cubed by itself. And everything else is in the first fraction except for a cubed, which is expanded out now. I put in the expression for the Bohr radius, 4 pi epsilon naught h bar squared over m sub e e squared. And I've got a mess of constants, but then the, with a little bit of combination, keeping the mc squared outside, I'll point out one little trick. There's this 1 over n cubed, which I turned into n over n to the fourth. That way I could group the n to the fourth with all this stuff and put it inside of a parenthesis and square it. So Check the algebra and make sure that you follow this first step to the second step. What's inside these parentheses is right out of the Bohr model. That is the eigen energy. That's your energy level that goes along with the principal quantum number of n. So n e sub n squared times n over m sub b 
e squared, the mass of the electron c squared, is what all of these constants add up to. Put that back into the expectation value of the perturbation Hamiltonian, which was this, goes in front here. This was all the constant stuff, and this was everything else. You can flip back a little bit and see that this aligns with what was there. It's in the red box here. You might look at this and say, well, in the event that L equals zero, we have a problem. <laughs> right? The denominator is zero. So what we're, we seem to be saying is that for S states, there's a singularity and the spin orbit coupling has infinite energy. But look at the numerator as well. When L equals zero, you know, J has to be one half, right? Because J goes from L minus S up to L plus S. If L is zero, J is simply one half. And the numerator is also zero. So in fact, the spin orbit energy is equal to zero in the event that L equals zero. You can add this to the relativistic correction that we did last time to get the complete fine structure energy of the hydrogen atom. Spin orbit coupling isn't all of the fine structure energy. We have to add that expression for that we came up with before for the expectation value of the perturbation Hamiltonian due to the relativistic velocity of the electrons. And we add them together and we have the fine structure perturbation energy. And here they are together. This was last time's result, the relativistic energy. And this is our new result, the spin orbit coupling energy. And they go together to give you the fine structure energy. Using the little trick that L is J minus S, that is, L is always J minus a half. Replace L with J minus a half, and with a certain amount of algebra, you can reduce this to what's in the red box. I would call what's up at the top of the screen an answer. And what's in the red box is a simplified answer that is a lot easier to write. So let's go with what's in the red box. And here's the implication. So the hydrogen atom has its energy levels, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. And previously, we would have just taken those to have one energy, each one. With last time's result, where we had the unperturbed Hamiltonian plus the relativistic Hamiltonian, we found the energy eigenvalues for that. And we discovered that the S and P subshells were split. And they were split by a small amount something on the order of milli-electron volts. And now we add in the spin-orbit Hamiltonian, and what we find then is that these P-subshells split again. They split based on the value of J. And so like for a P-subshell, you know, J can be one-half or three-halves because it's L plus or minus S, where L is one and S is one-half. So we have these two values. Next time, we're going to look at the Zeeman effect which then takes each one of these J-level splittings and splits them more because of the presence of an external magnetic field or a very strong internal magnetic field. Sometimes the Zeeman effect washes out these splittings, and we'll look at that next time. This will uh, be it for spin-orbit coupling for this time. We will apply some of these ideas later to the rubidium atom, so you can see this at work in heavier atoms.